Hi everybody, welcome back to the enterprise stage of API Days Live India 2021. We will be now having the sessions on connected finance theme. We'll be joined by speakers from IBM, Hyperface Technologies, Angel Broking, MOSIP, DCB Bank and DGLI. The first session will focus on the future of financial services. We all know about the past of financial services. We all remember those good olden days when you used to carry a passbook to the bank to get it updated, stand in a queue, wait for some time to get it updated. We all know the current state where you can just need to send an SMS and you will get a, a, the updates on your bank balance. Or else you just open up your mobile, select the app and it shows you what is a band balance. Or else there is an another app which will show you your consolidated review across three different banks. But what is the future holds? What is going to be the future of uh, financial services looking like? Let's hear it from an expert in this field. We'll be joined by Bharat Bhushan. He's the distinguished engineer and CTO for financial services at IBM and he spearhead the innovation and provide innovative solutions to banks and financial institutions by bringing together IBM's all product suits, all the capabilities, research, and also the large extended um, partner ecosystem, including fintechs. Hi, Bharat. Hi, Prashant. Um, thank Hi. you uh, for that introduction and thank you for uh, for having me as, as uh, this is, this is uh, I think fourth or fifth time at the API days, and it's it's probably one of the best um, conferences I have the opportunity to to speak at. Um, but before I, I get into the content, um, I, I just just want to say I hope everyone is okay, and uh, I know the situation in India in the context of the virus is, um, is hasn't been great, and and I hope um, everyone listening to this is uh, is is safe and, and your families are okay. Uh, our, our thoughts are with you and, and your families. Um, so now getting into the into the content, as uh, Prashant said, I, I work for IBM. I lead our banking and financial services industry uh, across uh, EMEA. Um, and for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I will take you through some of our lessons learned and some of the work that we are doing with, with our clients and some of the best of breed case studies um, in how, in what's, what the, and, and def, what the definition of future of finance really is. And to Prashant, to your point, I think you know when you look back at the last, uh, you know, most of growing up in India, a lot of my aunties and uncles worked in banks. I remember going back to some of these banks, and there was like paper from floor to ceiling. Um, the you know you 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 had to, quite often you had to know somebody to get a better service. Uh, obviously, computerization changed a lot of that. You could access a lot of your information online, and now I think with the advent of uh, mobile devices in everyone's hands. The, the the ask now is what's next? You know, banks have done an excellent job of transforming that paper-based passbook into a mobile app, um, but but that's not the end of digitization. And that's really um, th that's really digitizing paper. But 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 the future of finance is is very different. And 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 I think it's in, it's invisible finance. You know, invisible banking is where uh, the, the 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 future lies. And so, but before I get to that, let me perhaps cover, and I know that I'm predominantly speaking with um, um, audiences based in India, but I want to give a slightly broader perspective first, as um, particularly as you look at the industry with the lens of um, COVID-19, our clients have been very, very stretched financially, operationally, as, as they've really struggled to, um, to get people into offices, get people into contact centers, um, uh, due to due to people catching viruses, or also due to lockdown measures as well. So I think you know the last kind of twelve to eighteen months have been extremely challenging. At the same time, what I have what I observed was the, the within the first kind of thirty to forty days, people got used to working from home. All the provisions and access were sorted out. Uh, particularly those financial institutions that were digital from uh, from the word go uh, were much faster in adopting some of those services. Now, in certain parts of the world, the, the, the economic crisis has meant that the interest rates um, have plummeted 
to near zeros. Um, I know that's not the case in India, but um, but imagine all the large institutions that also have branches and also have significant corporate business, treasury business, um, and they have a significant NRI base uh, customer um, outside of India as well. So you know, think about the, um, the 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 suppressed income that they have because of the interest rate margins that they used to be able to make before. At the same time, the customer expectations have changed. You know, as even during the pandemic, people still had to do banking. They still had to you know, go out and and get a loan or maybe um, delay their, their their mortgage payments, uh, get a payment holiday, uh, and things like that. So customer expectations have continued to evolve. And it's not the banks that are setting that expectation. It's the platforms, the digital platforms that your customers are using on a daily basis at home, um, is setting that expectation from, um, from 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 financial institutions as well. At the same time, in India and everywhere else in the world, we are seeing this major disruption from the fintech and also from the big tech. Big techs like um, Apple and Goldman Sachs, for example, partnering up. We've seen. Amazon, eBay offering significant amounts of loans to small to medium-sized businesses because these platforms really operate based on the data. And now look, look at a traditional bank. You know, they would they would look at credit scores, they'd look at your transaction history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you're not known to the bank, it's very hard to, to get a significant um, amount of loan. Whereas these digital um, organizations where you perhaps might be listing your products, they get a complete visibility of the quality of your product. What are your customers really saying um, about your product using natural language? Um, and uh, you know, what's your inventory? How much profits are you making? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some real life data that they're using to really um, fund the, the the supply chain, fund the the inventory management of those uh, those small to medium sized businesses as well. And at the same time, and it's very it's it's um, it's it's, um, it's not great to say, but we you know we. We see fraud and financial crime ex really accelerate over the last um, few months as well. As as fraudsters really target the most vulnerable, um, you would particularly at times like this when people are really stretched for income, they are very vulnerable. They're looking for uh, for avenues. So if you were a vulnerable that person that couldn't make their mortgage payment that month, and you suddenly received um, a text message on your phone that looks like it's come from your bank. Um, and has a link to say, you know, click here to uh, to initiate your um, your payment holiday. Most customers are submitting to those types of requests. People are pretending to be calling from banks, um, as well as cyber attacks um, as well. So what we've seen is cyber attacks are getting increasingly difficult uh, to 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 determine whether they're coming from a bad actor or a bad state. So that differentiation is um, is is really thinning out. And at the same time, I think the fintechs of the world are are really advancing the the industry really well. They are the, 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 the fintechs are really focusing on a very niche uh, problem statement that might be you know, international money transfers. It could be um, the way that uh, foreign exchange um, is is transacted, uh, or treasury management, cash management, etc. But all of these ideas collectively put together are really putting a lot of stress on on the financial services system. And so the idea. Uh, that I think about often is what is the future of banking to go back to the kind of key message for, for this session. You, know, you look at um, uh, financial institutions typically worked in the way that they produced a product in the back office. They would, that would be a current account, mortgages, savings, and, and so on. And they would sell it um, through their front office, which is their branches and brokerage um, uh, uh, systems and, and so on. But now, and that's the, the bit in the middle where you have bank as a producer, but now you're getting into a platform today where you are not using your own uh, uh, distribution channels, but you might be also doing co-branding and using someone else as to distribute your products. You know, think about so many um, institutions. Uh, airlines are very good examples where you know you will get um, an airline offering you a credit card. I mean, airline is not really a financial institution, but they are the distribution point for a bank for a financial institution. Um, to to sell and um, uh, reach the, the the hundreds of um, thousands, if not millions, of customers uh, that the airline um, holds. Um, to then, uh, 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 Prakash, you, you, uh, Prashant, you talked about the account aggregation capabilities. You know, particularly in India and um, uh, in a, lots of countries around the world, we we uh, we know that open banking uh, is is coming uh, in in uh, European in the European Union and certain parts of um, uh, of 
Middle East and Africa, as well as uh, North America, the, the ability to expose uh, APIs so that uh, third parties that are regulated in most countries, in some countries they're not regulated, they, are, they, just, they just have a bilateral relationship with, um, with a financial institution, can actually help their customer in aggregating all of the assets into one place. Initially, this started off with just current accounts, but this is now expanding as a part of open finance um, initiatives across Europe. We are now seeing that this will eventually get to a point where you can aggregate your pensions, your stocks and shares, your savings, your fixed deposits. So holistic view, get, get a holistic view of your total net worth rather than just current accounts aggregated in one place. Um, and the second use case was around predominantly initiating payments from bank to bank rather than using a, um, a, a, a credit card or a debit card. Now, I know that that particular use case in India is really well solved and, and, and I'm you know, extremely proud of that. The, the bit on the right hand side of this is uh, bank acting as a marketplace. Um, and there are two aspects to this. You, you can either create, banks are either creating a marketplace or they're joining other marketplaces. Think of SBI Yono, for example, as uh, one of our key clients has created um, a marketplace where they're bringing um, hundreds of um, suppliers, hundreds of, hundreds of manufacturers into uh, Yono and, uh, and allowing customers to really use their data to buy those uh, products and services. But the other interesting thing is that now all of these are visible. You know, the, the, so I mentioned at the very beginning that the future of banking is invisible. And the reason I think that is, is that as we as individuals go out and live our, live our life, you know, we, we get ready, we go to work, we, we, we might in those days, you know, when we got into taxis, we didn't think about managing money. We didn't think about uh, making a payment. We just, we just wanted to get from A to B. Um, and I think the the value that financial institutions have got to provide is for me to just get on with my life as as a as a retail customer, or potentially as a small to medium sized business or a large corporate, rather than me having to think about uh, um, uh, banking and banking services. So this is where payments, embedded payments, banking as a service um, capabilities really uh, come into play. And we're working on a number of initiatives with um, uh, with some large banks uh, globally where they are embedding payments as a service in other platforms. So, you know, think of any digital platform that you might be using today. They, they might be a media streaming company. There might be a hotel booking service. There might be an e-commerce platform. Now, those organizations, or it might be a gaming um, uh, company. Right? They're not really a financial institution, but to disperse and reverse um, uh, payments, it takes a lot of time and effort. And there's lots of regulations around it, particularly as uh, you may be a company that may be in the media and entertainment business uh, with, with global um, audiences, as you collect those subscription fees, you know, five ninety nine or two ninety nine or whatever it is, you know, four hundred rupees um, a, a month for that service, you know, you really want uh, the financial institution s supporting you to collect that to provide treasury services, and not the not you. And, and equally, if you are hosting competitions, you're hosting all, all sorts of things where people could be joining you from all over the world, you don't really want to be thinking about um, sanctions and, and uh, fraud checking and, and making sure that you're not uh, going to be in scrut under scrutiny uh, because of the location where the money is being sent to. So the future of financial services is, is, is absolutely one of the biggest revenue making um, opportunity for financial institutions is on the right hand side, where you become a marketplace, where you use API and event driven architectures um, to really connect two ecosystems together, connect two entities together that customers would find useful um, on a daily basis, um, or embed banking services. You know, for example, um, in South America, if you wanted to sign up as an Uber driver, as you sign up to Uber, BBBA uh, uh, would, in behind the scenes, would provision an SME bank account for you, and all of your transactions, your rides, your your tips directly get deposited into uh, your account with BBBA. Now, this is a win-win situation for the for Uber in, uh, in South America because they can really um, accelerate the onboarding process because the hist historically it's extremely challenging for, uh, for, for any individual to open an SME account. It's a win for the bank because they're not only creating more client base because that Uber driver uh, will not only do their initial payments, which may be a small uh, income uh, for uh, BBBA, but eventually using that information, BBBA will be able to provide a loan so that, that that driver can upgrade the car, buy their own car, maybe buy a fleet of cars, 
uh, because they would have a, have a very close visibility of what that driver is doing. You know, how much, how many hours is that driver working? What kind of trips and money is he getting paid? Is he getting tips? You know, they will get real insight into the uh, the 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 the, um, the operations of that um, of that person of that business. Um, here are some more examples. Um, Hello Tractor is one of our other clients in um, uh, in, in Africa, where um, effectively think of it as uh, this as Uber, except uh, when a farmer orders an Uber, a tractor turns up with a certain equipment uh, for community farming. So um, and also so there were really three parties in in this engagement where you have the bank providing payments capability, embedded payments, um, and also solving. Uh, second entity was the tractor manufacturer. And then you have the community farmers. So in any typical platform, when you think about it, you've got two you know, multi-sided platforms. Uh, there's enough, um, this is well, really well documented on the benefits of network effects. Um, and as you, as you go about creating a product that is needed uh, by community farmers, in this case, you cannot afford uh, expensive equipment, um, and they mostly rely on manual laborers who may or may not turn up on time, may or may not do a good job, uh, and eventually will get slow and, and very expensive. Um, so in this case, the IoT sensors on, on the tractor really help the, the tractor manufacturer to do predictive maintenance. They can book things in. A community um, uh, farmer can book the right type of equipment, will, which will turn up on time, and something that will take um, a manual labor a month could be done inside four or five hours, um, particularly if it's a large field. Not only that, the uh, the angle here is also about creating value for the farmer. So using um, technology, they're also getting insights into the quality of the soil and advice on what type of produce they should really be uh, be, be investing in this year. You know, I think, uh, and there's a similar example in, uh, in India, actually, in one of our other client, Bank of Baroda, um, uh, whose uh, client base really is in the, farming industry. They created this this end-to-end -end platform. And we know that farming is a multi-generational uh, family-owned um, uh, 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 business. Uh, and and quite often, and I, you know, having born and brought up in a, in a small village in India, I know that farmers generally are very trusting of uh, financial institutions, trusting of, um, uh, of, of the people that they have dealt with for generations. And Bank of Baroda really wanted to extend that trust that uh, that these farmers have have uh, put in in the bank, and they created this end-to-end -end capability where everything from seeds to the market in a Monday can be um, uh, can be controlled, can be provided, can be facilitated and enabled uh, by the bank itself. So therefore, the farmer doesn't really have to worry about am I getting the right price uh, for these seeds? Am I getting the right um, price for this final produce? And all the shipping and and logistics, uh, etc., as well. So, uh, and and just like the previous use case I mentioned, uh, we are also providing uh, through Bank of Baroda some advisory um, services as well. So, IBM acquired a company called the Weather Company. So, if you are an iPhone user, or if you are checking weather on any well-known website, you are actually getting that insight from IBM Weather Company, uh, which is handling over a billion weather events on a daily basis uh, using multiple sensors that might be in the back of your uh, garden or perhaps some of the satellites that that orbit um, around Earth, um, and those that weather information can go back uh, 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 ten to fifteen years. So whether you are an, a trader looking at historical trends, or you are a farmer looking at you know what 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 what's the trend of um, of the weather? You know, do I do I plant certain um, crops that that need that additional heat, or do I you know is it likely to be that that this season will get colder? Uh, weather. So providing that last mile of services, in this case, you know, the bank clearly thought through that their traditional customer base are not really digital savvy. They are, um, they, they, they are, um, uh, and they're not using these digital services. So that last mile of advisory services, both in this use case and in the use case of um, HelloTrack, uh, were absolutely important in the adoption of, um, of these capabilities. Um, and similarly, you know, there, there are lots of other examples where we have done work with uh, with clients that are embedding payments, embedding data, embedding advanced analytics. Um, you know, I mentioned State Bank of India earlier on. Uh, we're very proud to to have supported SBI in the creation and the launch of um, Yono in India. We really brought together over uh, 100 uh, business partners, and through APIs, onboarding those. You know, creating that that experience that the user is um, is seamlessly 
bind those services in a safe and secure manner. Um, uh, and I think you know there's there's enough content. You 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 can request a copy of the slides, uh, and I will include links to the replays of broader capabilities. You know I can uh, SBI have spoken at um, our Think event a number of times, um, and you can really hear from the chairman and uh, the architect that will explain the the capabilities there. So just to show you um, in the last kind of two minutes or so. Uh, the advanced um, capabilities that other banks are building. So you, when you think about um, APIs, um, really APIs become the enablers for that that new business models I, I talked about. Because you interact with Uber, you interact with those uh, you know music, media, and entertainment companies through APIs and event-driven architectures, um, and creating a really a separation of concern between the messaging platform and the API themselves. Um, so I'd encourage you to have a look at some of these API portals. That my clients like BBVA and Nodia have built, where they're really going after uh, not just the open banking capabilities, but way beyond that, um, to show you the the art of the possible. So, if you're a large corporate looking to invest, in, looking to do FX trading, looking to buy um, uh, uh, currencies or do treasury management capabilities, you know these are this is really the the kind of the next uh, next version, the next capability where that financial institutions are building. Now, NetBank is one of our clients in South Africa, actually, where uh, there's no open banking capability there. Uh, uh, but the bank bought into the idea of creating APIs uh, to create and facilitate a broader ecosystem. And through these APIs, they're now entering new phases, new partnerships that perhaps the bank didn't even imagine um, a little while ago. So um, I'll maybe just uh, finish on, on this chart, you know, given that I'm talking on an API, at an API conference. Um, so typically, in a at a mature organization, and there are more phases uh, before you get to four, phase four. What I observed was this is the end-to-end -end architecture that our clients are building um, to create that that capability that allows you to really focus on creating separation of concerns. Uh, so you have multiple sets of microservices uh, sitting behind your API management capability. In, in our case, it's IBM API Connect and Data Power as the security gateway orchestrating a, a, a ton of activities internally and with third parties. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, fraud and, and financial crime has really um, uh, really come to, to the front over the last 12 to 18 months. So this, we've seen some interesting integrations being done to prevent uh, those kind of frauds, such as SIM swap checks, uh, making sure that the SIM hasn't been swapped uh, in the last few uh, uh, minutes and months, and managing managing multi multitude of data to really reduce uh, that risk. But it's not going to be, you know, it's not um, a straightforward um, uh, straightforward journey to become from going going from having a, you know sixteen thousand branches, ten thousand branches on on the high streets um, to actually not having any branches. Uh, or maybe maybe there's a there's a hybrid of the two that eventually. The number of branches on our high streets will uh, will shrink, and the number of invisible services that the financial institution is providing uh, will increase. Um, so, uh, on that note, I'd like to maybe pause here and um, and see if there's uh, there are any questions. In the uh, in the slide pack, you will see lots of um, content that you can have a look at in terms of the additional capabilities. You're welcome to to come and uh, attend some of our workshops. Um, and download some of the papers um, um, here as well. So, um, Prashant, maybe I can stop here and see if there, there are any questions or comments. Yeah, um, uh, Bharat, so uh, everybody knows, the industry knows uh, that they, they need to change, they need to open up, they need to adopt an open banking or API, or open finance, whatever you call it, different names, either market-driven or regulatory-driven. But uh, uh, has the resistance, I mean, what I have seen is the, uh, they know I, as a banker, a, bank, a banker knows that they need to change, but then once they start exploring at those options, somewhere down the line, it uh, becomes, okay, how much is the mandated by regulator? Let me look, do that first, and then I look at the later. Yeah. So has yeah. the resistance uh, uh, weaning away, reducing, or where, where, where do you see that? Or yeah, so, is it more yeah, in... No, yeah. So, um, Prashant, when I remember, the reason I'm smiling is that the first three years of open banking, or PSD2 coming out in Europe, everybody just wanted to do the bare minimum. And now, kind of um, uh, five years on, you're now looking at the those the same financial institutions are seeing huge opportunity at the back of the, creating those APIs, creating the the infrastructure. 
And I think the, the challenge is that most institutions get comfortable um, in, in they know that you know, they have cash cows that are bringing that revenue, bringing that customer base. Uh, the, but most of all, they have the uh, they have earned the trust of the customer. You know, banks like SBI and Bank of Baroda and um, so many other uh, banks in India that have, that are state owned, and they have they know that the customer's money is safe and the customer is not going anywhere. But and fintechs mm -hmm. really take a little while to build up that trust over time. But but that tide is coming. You know that it's only a matter of time before. Uh, we've seen this with Starling, Monzo, you know, Revolut, uh, TransferWise, some of these fintechs that that uh, that we know know and love in in Europe, that uh, nobody took them seriously for the first 12, 18 months, but now you know more they they have over six million customers. Some of them have over six million customers and now expanding globally. So there's always that friction between old and new. You know, getting comfortable and doing something new. Um, I think my advice, if if any bankers listening to this session, is that don't look at the regulatory playbook. If you look at the regulatory playbook to see what you should do rather than what you what you should do to comply with the regulation as opposed to what value you're creating for your customers. Where are you taking that business um, to the next generation? Because the banking <clears throat> business model is not going to stay the same. You know, The future generation doesn't really think about banking products. They think about experiences. They think about, you know, how do I um, uh, create a life that is full of experiences rather than uh, a banking product, and they don't really want to have a one-to-one -one relationship with the bank manager like our parents, you know, my parents did. Uh, it's very, very different. So they need to cater for the uh, the 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 up and the next generation of customers and next generation of products that are going to be very different from traditional banking. Okay, yeah. uh, great. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks Thank for you, showing us how much invisible the future of financial services is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me and um, keep well thanks. and. Uh, and We're, we're all we're all thinking thinking of you. Thank thanks. you. Thanks everyone.